You're listening to XS Gaming Podcast, a podcast for gamers by gamers, with your hosts Xander Skolian and James Grusom, bringing you something old, something new, and a little bit of nostalgia too. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever time you guys are checking us out, and welcome to another episode of Excess Gaming Podcast. This is episode 108. We're recording this on September 27th. I'm one of your hosts, Xander Scullion, and joined with me is my wonderful co-host, Mr. James Grusom. What's up, James? Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope you are doing well. It's going to be an interesting few days for me as I'm on a pseudo-forced vacation from work. Apparently, I just worked too much, and they said, no more. They're not even going to let me work on Saturday until I get this crap cleared up. And you might wonder, why am I mad about that? Because I like working Saturdays. It's overtime, and it's an easier day. So hopefully, I will get a lot of gaming and movies and sleeping, because I'm going to be sitting around for five damn days. And that's uh, <laughs> re- it's really weird for me. You know, I didn't know soon enough where I could like plan – you know, maybe to go out of town for a few days with my wife. It just kind of happened. But hey, now I'm still getting paid, so might as well just hang out and have fun, right? That that's something you don't really hear that often. It's like a job being like, dude, you're working way too much. You need to take some time off. You just don't hear that often. It's usually the other way around. It almost feels like a punishment. We just have a thing <laughs> in our contract where we can't work over a certain amount of hours, and if they project you might do that, then. You got to start taking off, and you know I work the Saturdays all the time, which that probably bumps into it, and I don't take off much at all, you know. So I, it just goes to show I need to work less. That's the lesson I need to learn. <laughs> well, you know, before we get into the uh, the episode, I have to admit something. I have to confess something. I, uh, it, you know, it's been getting a little colder outside. Not super cold, but we're definitely feeling the fall weather. And man, I'm sitting here. With my pumpkin coffee, I had myself uh, some pumpkin oatmeal. I'm a pumpkin fanatic. I have to admit that. Uh, I love pumpkin. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't fault the people that do, man. And hey, this is the time of year where you can get that stuff. A lot of people get excited about it. Some people poke fun of it, but you know, it's it's just all in fun. You know? uh, I, I'm a oh, I'm a oatmeal fan myself. Actually, I've been eating a lot of that lately. Yeah, I just I, I get so freaking crazy about it, man. And it was weird because like the pumpkin spice stuff started coming out uh, earlier last month, like uh, like towards the end of August. I started seeing pumpkin spice stuff, and I'm like, man, that's too hot, man. When I, when I have pumpkin spice, it goes with like cool weather. And I was like, man, I can't. I mean, I love pumpkin, but I couldn't do it while it was too hot. But man, I got like um, the other day, I had like pumpkin sausage. Uh, my job started making pumpkin sausage, like pumpkin spice, and I'm like, all right, get that. It's freaking phenomenal. But it sounds yeah. interesting. Is it like Link or Patty? It's Link. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds like uh, that could be good. I'm not crazy about the pumpkin, but I'm not opposed to it. I love pumpkin <laughs> seeds. And, oh yeah, uh, I've heard of. Have you ever had the pumpkin soup? No, I haven't. I, I've never had that pumpkin bread. Also, oh great. yeah, and uh, you know, jack lanterns. They're awesome. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's getting close to Halloween, man. It's it's hard to believe, but it, this is like my favorite time of the year. I love like you know the fall and winter, like Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas all at the same time, like in that order. Like that's my favorite. So and of course we got some great games coming out. And uh, before we get into some of the games that's been coming out that I want to talk about, uh, mainly with the Nintendo Direct. Uh, so we got some information yesterday. About the new Atari box. Uh, this is the crowdfunded project by quote unquote Atari. And you know, Atari is pretty much just a brand name at this point. It's not the same folks that, you know, gave us Atari 2600. It's not the same team at all, but. I think they make t shirts now. I see them on t shirts yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's, it's more of like a brand and a notoriety, if anything else. But uh, this is really interesting, okay? When the Atari box was first announced, everyone thought it was an April Fool's joke. Everyone's like, oh, Atari's come out with a new console. And that's what they kept saying, how this was a new console. It wasn't just, you know, a quote-unquote micro console like uh, like the Ooh Yeah, that's a micro console. This was a straight-up uh, console. And, and the price, they just released the price tag to it, and it's a... Th- Throbbing two hundred to three hundred dollars. 
that it's going to cost. Uh, this is a crowdfunded project at the moment. Uh, they showed a little bit of the prototype. The prototype looks like a modern 2600. It's It's got the wood grain to it. And I, I don't know, man. This is, this is getting kind of weird. Like, the more I've been looking into it, the more I've been finding out about the people behind the project. Apparently, they're not... Um, they're not the most noblest people. Apparently, they're a part of two failed Kickstarters, which brings in probably why they're doing an Indiegogo. Uh, or, yeah, uh, Indiegogo. Not a GoFundMe, but Indiegogo. Because with Indiegogo, you don't really have to show a prototype. I mean, that's kind of what we saw with the Coleco Chameleon. Kickstarter, you're required to show a prototype. And they kind of showed a pseudo prototype of what they're working on. But the guys behind this, uh, I've been trying to relook up their names. Let's see. Um, the creator and general manager of Atari Box at Atari, his name is uh, Fiergal Mac. All right. You can look him up. And he's been a part of not one, but two major uh, Kickstarter scams doing, having to do with a uh, smartwatch. Now, the first smartwatch that he made was more of a a wristband USB, okay? And this was pretty much, they were pitching a $3 USB that you could get off AliExpress. They were pitching that for $59, and they were really talking about, they're like, you can save your memory anywhere, and you can wear it on your wrist, and you can hook it up to your PC, and you can transfer photos, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, they were even saying that it was like... The equivalent of owning a laptop, <clears throat> and and that it turned out to be a big scam in the sense that it took them a year to to even put out the thing, and then finally when they put it out, they pretty much uh, gave you the idea of how to make it yourself. You know, they're like, "This is how we made it. This is how you're going to make it when it comes to you." I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> it, I mean, it was terrible. And then they came out with this smartwatch that they claim was this, the, the fastest smartwatch uh, on the market. And it was pretty much an Android-based smartwatch. And again, it looked like a $10 knockoff from AliExpress. They are showing pictures of it with like the square watch. When they started showing like the demo units of it, it was a round watch. And they made a big deal about the fact that it can take a micro USB or, or a micro SD, I'm sorry, and put that in your watch and you can transfer it to your, your computer. And uh, it showed them trying to play Pong on this round watch that was just horrible. The touch screen was really bad. So this makes me kind of nervous. Now, a lot of people are like, man, this, this, this could be awesome. This is something great. But I don't know about you, James, but when I see these Kickstarters, I see like, the retro nostalgia curtain being pulled over people's eyes. I get very, very nervous. So I start doing some research. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is this is interesting. So so what are your thoughts about this? I think it stinks. You know? <laughs> it's just kinda like well for one thing, okay, I'm I'm very open to, you know, new consoles when they pan out. We've had a uh, you know, bad taste left in our mouths from seeing how a lot of those turn out in the past. Um it's a good way to get a product done, and like I said, if done right, the people that want it can back it because you got to look at something like this. It's like, who is this for? I can kind of see more in a sense how they were doing the flashbacks. Uh, I know they've done some more kind of special edition ones. They had a cool setup with one of those, built-in games. Maybe you could play all the different ones on it for Atari collectors you know, because there's a lot of people out there like that. This being a new one, you know, like did they just get the rights to the Atari name? Uh, I know we say like it's almost you know not really like a company. It's like was somebody able to just get the rights to to do this and still not you know fully sure like are they wanting it to be just like a you know for download stuff? It's not running any discs or anything, is it? No, no, it's all digital and it's pretty much like a glorified Steam box. That's what it sounds like. Because I mean uh, it's going to have an AMD custom processor. It's going to be running Linux. Uh, it's going to have its own customizable interface. Uh, they're talking about how it might be open source, you can run apps, you can stream, you can play music. I mean, to me, this sounds like a mini PC that, you know, maybe you can run some, you know, mid-range, maybe high-end PC gaming on it. Uh, it's going to come, of course, preloaded with Atari games. So you're going to get Atari games when you get the Atari box. But the more I, I look at it, the more it's just like, you know... For two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars, I mean, you could get a PlayStation Four 
really, really cheap and get a couple of games. Hell, you could get a OG Xbox One for like 150 now, and you can get a bunch of games. Uh, you could get a Nintendo Switch for that. It's like, do I really need the Atari box? I mean, I honestly think if this thing was a different uh, name, if it didn't have the Atari name, I don't think people would even care. Like if this yeah, thing was, it just, yeah, it definitely feels like it's kind of feeding off. You know, you said the the retro drapes have been opened. It kind of feels like it's just feeding off people's nostalgia. That people, it's like, oh, Atari. You know, it's, yeah. it's just a name. It, it has no meaning. You know, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be one of those like systems without a soul. You know, yeah. It, it's just, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I I don't think that's. I'm I'm curious. I'm curious to see how it pans out, but I don't really see it doing much, you know. I just I hope people don't get suckered and lose money, you know. I hope it actually is something that comes out and people get to back. But uh man, it's a tough time to try to come out I think with with a system. And especially if you're doing something that's just not really, you know, anything necessarily new and you can get Atari games. That's not a problem, you know. Yeah, Atari games are a dime a dozen and it's like uh, anyone that's listening that you've been hearing about the Atari box, just keep in mind this isn't, you know, a rehash of the company that you grew up with in the seventies or eighties, or maybe your parents talked about with the twenty six hundred. This isn't, you know, that company, and that's that's the biggest problem. That that was the biggest red flag when I saw when I was like, oh, Atari's come out with a new console, and everyone started tagging me on Facebook, and they're like, oh man, Atari's going back in the console market. And I mean, I admit, if they deliver what they're claiming uh, with this, uh, you know, AMD custom processor and the graphics and and the high end uh, stuff, if they if they do put it out, it's going to be a nice little powerful little thing. But it's just it's just not going to be up there with, you know, the PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, because the thing is, they're going to have to get backing from, you know, third party. Uh, they're going to have to have some sort of, like, stability where it's just like, yeah, this is, you know, a new console. I just don't see it. And, you know, with Indiegogo not being the most reliable as opposed to Kickstarter, I mean, at least with Kickstarter, you have to be a little bit more legit. There's still scams that happen on that fundraising project, but... Uh, it's a little bit less foolproof for the consumer as an in Indiegogo. Indiegogo is very, very trustworthy, and this is not a very trustworthy team that's behind the Atari box. So we'll see. We'll see. This to me, this looks like uh, like we're seeing the f- the freaking Coleco Chameleon all over again. And hopefully, people don't fall for it. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be uh man, it's the year of Atari. I tell you, it's coming back. <laughs> but in some in some positive news, I actually got some news about Xbox. Now I know uh some of our listeners they, they may be thinking sometimes we don't we don't talk a, a whole lot about Xbox One. And uh, a lot of that's because I don't own one. I'm pretty sure a lot of it's because you don't own one, James. We just it's just one of those things like if I don't own the console, it's not that I'm not into the news of that console. It's just that I'm just not as apt to talk about it as much because I don't have the console. That makes any sense. Yeah, and we have might have just seemed like a little bit negative to it at times. I know I have where it's just like – I'm kind of like what's the point if I've got a PS4? But I know a lot of people have them and love it, and at the end, you know, I really can't judge any of my thoughts are just – you know, it's just opinions, but I still hope they they do well. You know, yeah. I mean, we got the Xbox One X that's coming out very soon, and um, I mean that that console itself is going to be one powerful machine. It's going to have a lot of features and stuff like that. And one of the things that I got really excited about was Phil Spencer got a promotion to uh, believe vice CEO, and he's going to be head of the whole division of Xbox. And this is pretty important because I really think Phil Spencer has the uh, the spunk that Xbox and the Microsoft brand needs for console gaming. Uh, he's got some really, really interesting ideas. I know Microsoft's really going towards this like PC console hybrid, which done right could be a huge game changer. You know, to have this cross platform cross play, I think that's awesome and so consumer friendly because i mean how many times has there been a time that we've gotten a new game like say uh i'm just throwing it out there like say call of duty 
Okay, so you got Call of Duty at the time. You had like a PS3. All your friends had Xbox 360s, and you were like, "Man, I can't play Call of Duty with you." Well, now with this crossplay that Microsoft's really pushing and Nintendo's for, and Sony's still kind of on the ropes about it. With that being said, everyone can play in this online atmosphere, which I think is freaking awesome. And I, he's pushing that. He's pushing some of the ideas with the hybrid PC console uh, market. Hopefully, we'll start getting some uh, new IPs or rehash or reinvent, re, re uh, trying to say it here, reinnovation of IPs from the past. You know, I'm hoping we get some of that. Uh, that's that's really what I'm hoping, and I think I think he could do it. I, I got a lot of faith in him, so we'll see. You know, I guess just that idea, man, cross platform playing is just really amazing. It's something you kind of wish people had jumped on more to in the past, but uh, to see something like that finally happen just would be like a just like a really big step in gaming overall. I think, and I hope Sony jumps in on that too. And it's just, it's really a thing just, it's for the gamers, it's for the fans, you know, for their consumers. That's who it's like looking out for. So hopefully they'll come around and then, you know, they'll just all be kind of existing in a big online world playing together. Indeed, indeed. I mean, I think it's just, an, it's just enough that it, it has the gamers playing the games together online. But at the same time, it's not like, you know, it's not stabbing competition. Like there's still competition out there. You know, a lot of people sometimes wish that we just had one console that just everyone could just play on, and that would be terrible. That would be a terrible idea, because that would be a monopoly. They could charge us any price they want for games. That's kind of what led into the video game crash back in the early 80s, was, you know, there was no damage control. There was no no competition with the Atari 2600, and they started just putting out garbage and overpriced, and it was just terrible. So... I, I really do like crossplay. I like the concept of it. And I mean, I still love exclusives. And speaking of exclusives and Xbox, Cuphead's finally coming out. And uh, that looks really promising. I have a couple of friends of mine that uh, have it pre ordered and pre loaded. So when it uh, comes out, they can just get up and play it. I think it's like 20 bucks. It's on Steam and Xbox One. And um, that that is one game I, I do I do feel kind of bad that I that I'm going to miss out on. Hopefully, you know, maybe down the road it'll be released on the Switch or released on PS4. I could definitely see it on those platforms as well. But most importantly, I hope, since it's such a different kind of Xbox game, I'm hoping it does sell well. So Xbox and Microsoft's like, all right, well, we need to put out some more, you know, stuff like Cuphead, you know, some a little bit more niche stuff, a little bit more like indie retro goodness, because. You know, a lot of the stuff on Xbox is very, like, bro game, where it's like, you know, first-person shooters, racers, you know, which isn't a bad thing. But it's just, it's not my biggest cup of tea, and that's one reason why I don't own an Xbox One. And the Ori and the Blind Forest was one I always heard was really good. Oh, yeah. Really interested to play, but this still with only, like, a, you know, a couple games that are, you know, kind of drawing my mind that I'd want to get. It's still tough to go out. It's like, oh, man, I feel like I've got like enough systems, you know. Who knows? One day I could end up with one. They could have like that, you know, game changing game that uh, I just have to go get. What what game? What game would Xbox One have to make to make you say, okay, I need to buy one? Man, ah, uh, that's tough. Like. I, Symphony of the Night Two, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you you rob a good point because like I I've always said you know I've always said on the show that you know if any company wants me to buy their console, make an exclusive Castlevania. That's how I bought the PSP. Uh, but I think you know with Xbox and Microsoft owning Rare, I think if they made a, a brand new Battle Toads. I think that would make me want to go out and buy an Xbox One. If they came out with a new wasn't, battle, wasn't that supposed to happen at one point? It's always it's been a rumor for a while, but nothing like set in stone. But you know, with you know, maybe with Cuphead, maybe if it gets a lot of uh, attention in Lucky Tales, which is a really interesting platformer on Xbox, maybe if those two get really, um, uh, really good standing gaming ovation or whatever, we could get some. Uh, 
get some new ideas like that. Like I would love a new Battle Toads. Um, you know, if they if they came out with Star Wars Knights of Old Republic three, I would definitely get an Xbox for that. Uh, I'm trying to think of some more like maybe like a new Jet Set Radio, you know. Because I know. Oh uh, yeah, if they ended up with uh, how that was on there before. Yeah. How, before how the old Xbox, you know, was really awesome because it pushed a lot of Sega titles, a lot of new ones, and you know, sequels to older ones like the Panzer Dragoon and such. And of course, you know, we had the Shinmu too. So you know, if they could get the rights, you know, to a certain, you know, a couple companies have their own. You know, like for me, Yakuza was a a system buyer. Um. So maybe, you know, another series like that, if they could get a hold of it, that could really uh, grab people. I think my cat just destroyed something. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that would just be really sweet to see, you know, something that really made you want to go out and pick one up. Because, I mean, the, o- the OG Xbox is cheap. It's like 150 like, used. I think I had uh, saw a sign at a pawn shop right by my house where they were selling at one point. They were selling uh, Xbox Ones for 80 bucks. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, <laughs> I, I almost, I was like, man, I almost want to go buy one. But at the same time, I was like, I'm kind of scared to buy an $80 Xbox one. Either it's like been stolen or it probably doesn't work. That's just too good to be true. Yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit low. <laughs> a little bit sketchy on that one. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they just meant it was an original Xbox. That's what it was. I don't know. It was, it was, it was something weird. I was like, 80 bucks, really? But uh, going into some of the Nintendo talk, and you notice we're not really talking too much about Sony, because Sony hasn't really done too much. Uh, even with Tokyo Game Show, I didn't see anything with Sony. I was like, oh my god, we got to talk about this. But uh, Nintendo had a Nintendo Direct, and it, it was a pretty good Direct. I mean, it wasn't breaking uncommon ground. It wasn't like you know they were releasing a bunch of stuff about new games. Uh, you know, they talked about Mario Odyssey. They talked about the Nintendo Arcade Archives that are coming out, which is really cool. Um, if some of you guys are unfamiliar, Nintendo did have arcade cabinets of some of their classic titles like Super Mario Brothers and Punch Out. And while they look a lot like their NES counterpart, they were actually very different. Like Super Mario Brothers versus on the arcade, the stages were different. Uh, it had a different timer system to it. It was really interesting. Same with Punch Out. Punch Out had uh, a different uh, graphics to it. It looked more like Super Punch Out, where it was more of the first person view with uh, Little Mac. Uh, they're coming out with that. I think uh, the first release is going to be Mario Brothers, which is the original Mario Brothers, not the Super Mario Brothers. But they got that coming out. Also, uh, they mentioned a big third party bombshell, and that is Doom. And Wolfenstein 2. And this is where we're going to kind of kind of talk about some of the controversy with Nintendo. Uh, and I don't even know why it's controversy. Because this is something that we knew when they first announced the Switch. And that is the memory issue. Uh, you know, NBA 2K uh, 17 or 18. Can't really remember because I'm not big in the sports. 18. Came, 18. It was 18. Yeah, came, yeah it came out. And the game is too big to run on the Switch. Like, you need a micro SD card to run it. And this isn't the first game that's done this. Uh, Dragon Quest Heroes uh, 1 and 2 bundle that was released in Japan. You, you're going to have to need, you know, extra memory to play that. Because the Switch only has 32 gigs of memory. And that's been kind of some of the issue that people were talking about. And when they heard about Doom and Wolfenstein 2... They're like, oh man, this is something else that we're probably going to have to get into. So, so what, what are your thoughts about the whole memory thing, James? I mean, I knew it was going to happen. I mean, maybe it's a little disappointing if you're not aware and you get a game right up front. Uh, hopefully, you know, maybe they, I don't know if they need to come with a warning, you know, on them stating it's like, you will need more memory. Uh, it is a very low amount, but getting more memory is just something that's standard with systems nowadays Uh, my ps4 i haven't even had a year and i got the terabyte and it's been full it's like i don't even but i'm like what happened it seems like i had my ps3 like forever before that uh got that problem but you know i'm gonna need to get a new one for that and i thought i was actually gonna need to get a you know memory card of some sort when i first got the switch uh but my brother was like nah dude he's like you're good right now and, you know, for everything I downloaded, which is not, you know, huge games, lots of eShop titles, 
I hadn't had any issue, but, you know, I knew it was something coming. Um, hopefully, you know, they'll just be good, you know, affordable ways to upgrade. I'm not really sure how much, you know, memory cards and such cost or if you can use well, any kind on there. Yeah, I was about to say, that's, that's the beauty of it is they're not coming out with, like, specific brand Nintendo memory cards that you have to get for the Switch. You can use a micro SD card. So, I mean, you can get a 128 gig micro SD card if you get them on sale for like about 30 bucks on Amazon. Normally they're like about 40 or so, which I mean, most people like myself, I mean, because, you know, I do like the YouTube and stuff like that and I film videos. I have, you know, SD cards and micro SD cards laying around. I, the other day I found a, a micro SD card. It was like a 16 gig in one of my old GoPros. And I'm like, oh man, I forgot I even had this. So I'm probably going to format that 16 gig micro SD and put it in the switch for now. Uh, just to have that little bit of space. Now, what's really cool about the Switch is if you get a lot of physical media, you won't really necessarily need extra memory, as long as it's not something like NBA 2K18 or Dragon Quest Heroes or maybe Doom or Wolfenstein 2, maybe some of these more heavier games. It all depends on the third party of how they want to, uh, how much they want to spend making these cards, because there's different size cards that... They can put on these games. So it depends if they want to shell out and put a, you know, a 16 gig game on, you know, a, a nice card that has the memory capacity of that. Or if, you know, they want to freelance off of a micro SD. But it's, it, like I said, it was something that I saw people like complaining about and freaking out about. And I'm like, dude, we knew when they first announced the Switch, they're like, yeah, this is going to be a 32 gig. And I'm like, ooh. I was like, I don't know about that. I mean, even back then, I was kind of like, I don't know, 32 gigs, man. Like, the Wii U couldn't handle, like, just 32 gigs of memory. I mean, Fatal Frame took the whole thing. You know, you couldn't even play that game if you didn't have an external memory card. Yeah, I, yeah, I would have ended up getting that one for sure. Uh, yeah, I thought just the initial 32, I'm like, man, that's kind of small. But I guess they do things at the start, you know, to maybe, like, cut down on some cost and you know, it seems like it's pretty easily upgradable and affordable. So it's you know, it's just part it's part of gaming with consoles now. It's just it's been like that, and I don't know if it's going to change. Plus, one day you know we'll get like a zillion terabyte system, and maybe you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably eventually you know it's all going to go into cloud. You know, cloud memory is. Uh, you know, something that's really popular and pretty soon it'll get to the point where, you know, you'll get a console and just have cloud memory at that point. Uh, yeah. Which, which, which isn't a bad thing, but at the same time, it's like, you know, then you definitely have to be on the internet. But I mean, uh, I don't know. It didn't really bother me too much when I first heard about it. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'll just, you know, upgrade it and get, you know, some sort of memory card or, or something like that. A SD card. I mean, for the Switch, no big deal. Yeah, hey, at least we're getting powerful games on there, right? Yeah, I mean, we're getting Doom. I mean, the fact that we're getting Doom on Nintendo itself, just that sentence alone, it, it, it shows that Nintendo is really doing something different with the Switch. Now, the Switch has been uh, top dog in sales other than July. July, Sony won that month because, I believe, because of Dragon Quest XI came out in Japan. Uh, that, I think that just totally floored it. But other than that, I mean, the Switch has been selling really well. It's over 5 million units sold worldwide, which is already, you know, right up there with the Wii U. The Wii U was out for five years and sold 15 million. The Switch has been out for less than a year and sold 5 million. So that's a really good sign. And, you know, sometimes I think also the memory issue could probably play into the cost, like you were saying, with the Switch. Because, I mean, I'm pretty sure if it had a very beefy memory to it, it probably would have been more expensive. And plus, it may have sucked more of the battery life. You know, because there's some games on the Switch that if you're playing in handheld mode, like Zelda, you can only play like two hours of it before you have to charge it. Could you imagine if they had like a very uh, high-powered CPU and memory? It would probably would have... It'd probably like to be the freaking Game Gear at that point. Yeah, you get like 10 minutes of gameplay. Yeah, exactly. So... It is what it is, but uh, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what's been going on with gaming news, and uh, what we're going to do, guys, we're going to take our little break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, games that we were very excited about, 
and they came out when it just didn't live up to the hype. And we kind of we had kind of have a story with this, and there's a reason why we kind of came up with this idea, and we'll get into that when we come right back. So sit back, for relax, guys. We'll be right back. We are back, guys, and yeah, have you ever gotten a game that you were so hyped about, you were so stoked, you even took a day off work, maybe you called in sick, I don't, I don't, I won't judge you, but the game comes out and you finally get to play it, and it just did not live up to the hype. Maybe the hype's just because it was too high, you just had too many, too many expectations, or maybe the game just isn't as good. Uh, we're going to talk about that now, before we get into our own personal stories of games that we played that just didn't live up to that hype. I did ask this question to Excess Game Podcast group page. And if you guys want to join our group page, be sure to check us out on Facebook.com slash group slash Excess Gaming Podcast. Uh, got a couple of replies. Uh, Chris, a.k.a. BioPhoenix, he says, uh, Genji Days of the Blade. Loved the first one on PS2, but the but the game just felt so bare compared to it. And you know that that's some of the issues sometimes with sequels. Like you'll play the first game, and it'll be amazing, and then the sequel comes out, and it's just kind of like Luster. I've had that moment. Yeah, that's always the thing in series. And, you know, a lot of us will have one where there's just one of those games that just didn't quite click. Sometimes it's just a personal one that's, you know, just one of the series you don't like. Or sometimes it's one that, you know, everybody can agree, like something just kind of went wrong. And when the other ones are so good, you know, like I said, expectations are high. Sometimes it's pushed through advertisement and hype. And sometimes it's our own, you know, where there's just something you really want to get at. It's just, man, (laughs) it's just not the same. Yeah, and uh, Jason... Uh, he says lightning returns, and we'll see a little we'll see a little trend in that because right after he said lightning returns, uh, Bill Bush, uh, Reploid Bill, a really really cool guy, he says uh, Final Fantasy thirteen, which is the the prequel to Lightning Returns. He says I realize that's a common answer, but my reason is a little different as for why it did nothing for me. I bought the game on release day and had a friend living with me and a roommate. All three of us got it. We lived in a gaming household. The living room had three TVs, and I was working extreme overtime, 16 hours, 16 hours a day. I played a total of three hours of the game and just saw the entire game in passing. Every day I woke up, it was on the two TVs, and I just sat in the living room and the two TVs uh, watching it before, and I just went to work, and he's saying a lot of two TVs. I'm trying to realize. <laughs> it's like two TVs, two TVs. Uh, I went to work, and it was on two TVs, and I came home, and it was on two TVs. I saw the game so much that there was no surprise for me when I played it myself, and the entire experience turned out to be didn't turn out to be as great. And I was looking forward to a roller coaster ride, then realizing that all it was was one circle with no up or down, and then stop. And, you know that that can ruin it sometimes when you know little too much about a game. 
uh, I know even you and I, when we play certain games, I I know you try to make a try to make a, a a statement, and I try to do the same. Where you and I will talk about a game, but we don't try to spoil each other. Like sometimes we'll ask each other, like, "Did you get to this part? Did you get to that part?" Because yeah, yeah, because it kind of ruins it sometimes if you know way too much about a game. Yeah, it's good. It's that too. I can you know knowing about it, and sometimes too just seeing a game. So much. <laughs> Sometimes if you just see it, you almost just get kind of tired of it before you even get a chance or it just gets, you know, overwhelming. It's too I, much. Yeah, I'm one of those kind of people sometimes that if something's like really popular and people are going crazy about it, like something about me like makes me not even want to play it just over principle. Like I'm like, I, I just don't want to play it because one, it's not because I'm trying to be like edgy or like hip or something like that. But it's because like I hear about it so much that I know it's not going to live up to to those expectations. And ninety nine point nine percent, I'm right about that. You know, there'll be like some game that comes out and everyone's like, "Oh, this is the best game ever! This is amazing!" And you see people talk about it like all day on social media. And then you get them, you play it, and you're like, "Well, that's fun, but I I don't get why everyone's so excited about this." You know, there's a couple of games that's been like that. I mean. Um, like Destiny's one of those games that's kind of like that with me, you know. I I like the concept of it. It's not a bad game, but it's just one of those games that I hear so many people talk about it that it just it doesn't get me excited. Like I've never been like, oh man, I need to go play some Destiny because I already know everything about Destiny because I hear everyone else talk about it. You know? Yeah, that's one of why I've, I've never played that myself. As much as people talk about it, I don't really know anything about it. <laughs> I mean, I play. I mean, the most I played the Destiny is I played the the beta of the first one like three years ago. I played the beta and I was like, oh, this is not a bad game." And then you know, Destiny the first one had a lot of uh, hiccups with DLC and microtransactions, and uh, you know, just getting the story itself like had to do with money. And I'm like, oh, I don't really want to take part in that so i never got into it so by the time destiny 2 came out when that just came out everyone was like oh man you're getting destiny 2 and i'm like well i wasn't really that into destiny 1 and i i I don't want to jump on a sequel you know so it's just kind of like i I don't know i think i'm going to probably go through the rest of my life never playing destiny that's just you'll probably be okay (laughs) i i say that but watch like freaking like two years now on a podcast i'm like so i started playing destiny (laughs) five but uh but yeah i mean that's some of the things uh for me you know i've i've had some games that i was really really hyped about Uh, one that really sticks out in my mind is motherfucking castlevania lord of the shadows 2 (laughs) you know when this game was first announced we had just started our podcast i remember you and i like every other episode we were counting down the days the weeks the months that we were like you know upset about delays we were all about this game and i remember when the game finally came out i remember i took that day off work i mean i was a manager at the time so i was able to write the schedule and i i wrote down on that day i gave zero fucks i wrote down castlevania day i am off like this game's coming out, I've been waiting on for it for you know uh, a year and a half after Lords of Shadows because I really liked that one. I was like, I'm I'm taking this day off. You guys better not call in sick. I'm gonna be off work playing Castlevania. And sure enough, I got up that morning, got some breakfast, went to GameStop, picked it up, went home, started playing it. I was like about two hours into it, and I'm like, this game is garbage. It was. It was very much what Chris was ex- describing with the other game that he was talking about, where the first game was really good, but the sequel just felt so dead. Lords of Shadow is not a bad game, but it's not a Castlevania. And, I mean, I understand it's a reboot, but there was just so much stuff they put into it that was just like, it just felt so disassociated from the series. I mean, for the, the stealth missions and the, you know, taking cover, like Gears of War. It just, I don't know, it was like... You know, when the Lord of Shadows came out, it's like they had some freedom. And they're like, well, this is going to be a Castlevania reboot, so we're going to do some things a little differently, but keep that Castlevania flair. And when Lords of Shadows sold so well, because that is, believe it or not, that's the highest selling Castlevania game in the series, Lords of Shadows. When that sold out, they were like, all right, well, we got even more freedom. Let's add this to it. And it was just, it was horrible, man. Well, 
I, I, that I was like one. It. You know, I got it too, and I'm not the hugest fan of Lord of Shadows. I, I thought it was pretty good. You know, it could even be like really good. And I played that one for a bit. My wife had got me the sequel, and yeah, man, I played it just for a little bit. I remember getting to a boss, and I just got irritated. I didn't even play it two hours. I don't think. Not even sure where I got to. I just put it down. I said, maybe I'll try it later. Yeah, and that just never happened. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because my sister's boyfriend uh, actually just borrowed my copy a couple of days ago. And uh, I was outside smoking, and he comes out there, and he was like, you know, going to try to ask me advice about Lords of Shadows too. I guess he was at a part where he was kind of stuck or something. I'm like, dude, I haven't played that game in three years. I was like, I bought it day one. I played it for like three hours, and I put it on the shelf. I'm like, I'm the worst person to talk to about <laughs> Lords of Shadows. I was like, because that game just had such a, a bad taste in my mouth. And the only reason why I still have it is because it is a Castlevania game. And plus, I'm pretty sure if I was to take it to GameStop, I'd probably get like $2 for it. So I'm, I'm just stuck with it. It's like an STD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an uncurable one. Even Mirrors of Fate, you know, was pretty lackluster. The fact that it's yeah. more of a 2D Castlevania and... You know, uh, the first one was definitely the, the highlight of that series. Uh, I know for me, being a, a wrestling fan, and this, you know, is going way back as far as this game. Uh, you know, of course, it played pro wrestling really fun. But you hear about WWF WrestleMania. You know, of course, it's in magazines, you know, being advertised on wrestling. Uh, it was one of the first games I rented uh, yeah, so it was did, wasn't one of, like the first wrestling games to have actual like wrestlers on it too. Like, yeah, licensed. Yeah, that was pro the thing. The first, yeah, WWF man, Hulk Hogan, Ted DiBiase, Macho Man, and it is just uh, man, it is not a wrestling game. The guys just walk around the ring, kind of punch each other. And you pick up, you know, crosses for Hogan and money, and it, it's just so bad. You know, you wait, you just, you want it to be some kind of, you know, magical experience is what you're hoping. So you're thinking pro wrestling, but it's going to have like Hogan, it'd be great and just terrible. And I mean, it just kept coming and coming over the years with, with wrestling. Uh, WrestleMania Challenge was actually pretty, I thought it was pretty fun, but everything else just downhill. Super Nintendo, you know, Super WrestleMania, uh, that should have been a sign. You know, I guess oh, it was more. Yeah. But it it wasn't that bad. The thing was, you know, it looked great, but just, uh, you know, it had the characters, but everybody had the same moves. Mm -hmm. Nobody had, a, you know, their their finishing move, their special. It was just kind of blah. Yeah. And it then it like, finally picked up with Royal Rumble after that, and then it was yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, because I remember getting Super WrestleMania, and I played WWF Raw. Before I got Super WrestleMania, I, I bought Super <laughs> WrestleMania and I played that and uh, I was like, oh my gosh. I remember I bought it at Roses because it was on sale. It was on yeah. clearance. And I was like, oh man, it's a wrestling game. It had uh, you know Razor Ramon on the cover of it. And I'm like, fuck yeah, I won for the bad guy. <laughs> it was such a bad game. But when you said wrestling, I was seriously thought you were going to mention um, freaking WCW Nitro and WCW Thunder. Well, oh. I actually had those on my list, too. Oh, God. <laughs> so bad. You know, those were definitely ones, you, like you said, playing Super WrestleMania after Raw it is really bad. But not near as bad as playing Nitro after playing Revenge. You know, it, Nitro is still the game that got me to buy a 64. So I kind of thank Nitro for that. But just... Man, it's so it's just so odd how you can have, you know, two WCW games on two different systems and completely different. Yeah, I mean cuz I remember when I got WCW Nitro, I actually borrowed it from a friend of mine. Like I let him borrow a game, I borrowed Nitro and I took it home. And I remember when you first start the game, okay? Cuz I had it on PlayStation. When you first started out, it had like the FMV sequence of like wrestling matches like a little montage and you're like oh yeah yeah this is awesome and then before you'd pick the fire they would have like that little fmv sequence of like they would like have a little shoot you know but oh you know pick me i'll beat this guy up you know his you own know. like neck bone yeah you know <laughs> and i was like this is cool you know i was like this is awesome and then i went to play the game and it was like it wasn't a wrestling game 
it was like a really bad like arcade brawler or something. I don't know. It was really it was I felt like the characters moved really, really fast. Like it was very, very fast paced, but it wasn't like fast paces and like playability. It was like they just took the game and they just sped it up. You know? Yeah, it definitely had kind of like a you know, almost like a jittering to it. Like yeah. things just kinda of flashed across the screen. Uh yeah, really bad arcade kind of fighter. You know, kind of pit fighter ish. Yeah, really. yeah, we're yeah, might be really insulting was. pit fighter, but it's <laughs> it's definitely a, a, along those levels, and just man, you know, and I could say I was pretty excited, you know, I was just thinking it was another, you know, WCW game. It's like, wait, well, hey, Revenge is good, like this doesn't look like it, but man, it's probably going to be, you know, pretty great. I, and, I, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember I played Nitro. Got burned by that, and I'm like, man, I'm glad this isn't my game, <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, I gave it back to my friend, and then, like, you know, I think about a year later, they came out with WCW Night uh, Thunder, and I was like, well, this looks a lot like Nitro, but I'm like, maybe it's better though, you know. And it had like Wolfpack Sting, it had Wolfpack on there. I was a big Wolfpack fan, and I'm like, all right, cool, I'm gonna rent this. I went to Blockbuster and rented that, and that was just another thing. And I mean, that was one of the good things about you know growing up gaming when we were growing up gaming is that we were able to actually go out and rent these games and if they weren't uh living up to the height that we wanted it was a little bit of a less blow than spelling spending full retail even though it to- still totally ruined our weekends you know yeah still a bummer but like you said it's not nearly as bad <laughs> you know spending five dollars for a three-day rental as opposed to spending sixty dollars on something it's just it's uncomparable and yeah I, th- I think another game that i wanted to mention as well was uh resident evil 6 now i'll go on the record and say that i liked resident evil 4 and resident evil 5 is not that bad it's not a great game but i enjoyed resident evil 5 and uh, but i knew that resident evil 4 and 5 were like very different resident evils and i remember when they were advertising resident evil 6 they were kind of saying oh we're going back to the roots and they were showing like some of the clips of Leon, and it looked more like Resident Evil 4. It had a little bit more of a creepy aspect to it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, I went and I reserved a copy. I went and I picked it up. And the first thing that happened that tainted it for me was, I remember I told my friend Gabe, uh, Mr. Gribble, told him, I'm like, yeah, I got Resident Evil 6, and I showed him the cover of it, and he, he tainted it for me from the get-go. He's like, huh, the 6 looks like a giraffe getting a blowjob. <laughs> and so now every time I see it, that's what I see. I'm like, damn it, Gabe. But, all side, it's the game that matters. So I put the game in, I start playing it, and from the first part you start playing it, it feels like Resident Evil 4. I'm like, okay, this is, I can do this. I can deal with this. I'm sitting there playing it, having a great time. Then all of a sudden, the zombies start using guns. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And I mean, they weren't like, you know, grabbing the guns and like pointing at you and shooting. It was just like, kind of like zombies had an uh, M16 caught on their finger and it was just pulling the trigger and like, ah! <laughs> it was like sitting there spraying gunfire everywhere. And I was like, this is weird. And then after you beat the Leon story, you'd go into like, Wesker's son, and it became more of like a uh, you know quick time event, and then you get into like Chris Redfield, and it feels like Gears of War. I'm like, this is not Resident Evil, and that was just a huge hype killer for me, man. I just did not, I did not like that game. It was horrible. No, for me too. Uh, I was a big fan. Way of the Samurai, one and two on PS2. Very cool, just quirky games uh, a lot of things going on it kind of reminds me a bit of uh yakuza you know lots of just little story weird missions helping people out i was really excited because way of the samurai 3 came out on uh ps3 and it's kind of a you know it's a it's a, it's a low-key series i think it's like a cult series it has its fans but uh you know i pre-ordered it i think i was probably one of like a few probably didn't get very many pre-orders or many copies in the store, and it was one. I was excited, took it home, and I'm not even sure what it is that made it so disappointing. You ever oh, had the ones that, like is, that? I was like, isn't that terrible when something just doesn't feel right? Yeah, it's like it's just as it wasn't what I loved in the other two, and I don't really know if it was, you know, it played a little different. It, 
yeah, maybe it was the jump onto the PS3. But then when 4 came out, which I'd heard some good things about, and it was download only, but I just didn't want to. I was like, I don't know if I want to waste the space or the money. And I still kind of wanted to try it, but I was like, you know, just had to let it go. It was still really fun to go back and play the first two. And, you know, I might even go back and give 3 a try again. Uh, I actually have tried it a couple of more times. I don't know why. Uh, I keep giving it chances, but it just keeps letting me down. And, uh, that you brought up a good point because I was going to mention that. Have you? It's like sometimes I feel like you had to be in the right mindset to play certain games. Like because there's games that I, you know, had huge expectations for. I was hyped for. I'd get it and I played it, and I just was kind of like, ah, oh, okay. And I put it down, and I would play something else, and then I'd be like, you know, I need to go back to the game, and I'd go back to it, and I would fall in love with it it was like i just wasn't in that mind frame and uh i'm like that sometimes with games you know sometimes i have to kind of get myself prepared to play certain like jrpgs uh a good example of a game that i i wouldn't say i was hyped for i was more like intrigued and curious and i went and got it and it just didn't do it for me was on the xbox 360 was infinite uh undiscovery or was it Infinite Discovery? Either way, I always call it Infinite Disappointment. <laughs> Either way. Because, I mean, I got the game. It was really cheap. 360 didn't have a whole lot of JRPGs. So when they did come out, I definitely wanted to check them out. And I got it. And it was like the battle system was very Final Fantasy twelve like Which didn't bother me because that was like one of the aspects I actually did like about twelve Was I liked the battle system. But the story and the voice acting was just... Ugh. And then I found out like... The game had like 36 characters, and I was just like, I, I don't like that. I don't like a game playing that I have like a whole, you know, 36 people that I have to get to know. You know, I, I like, I kind of like games that have a really, really small uh, group of people that so you can get kind of connected with them and you get kind of attached to certain characters and hate certain characters. 36 is way too many, man. I'm like, who's this guy? You know? Yeah, just a bit of uh, maybe overdoing it, overcompensating yeah. for a bad game. And here's one I'm curious on your thoughts because most of the time, any ones I've ever played have not been uh, as good as I thought they should be. But uh, Godzilla games. Oh yeah, just because I know you're a big Godzilla fan, and you know they've spanned over back from the Nintendo uh, up through you know PS4 what, a year or so ago. Yeah, um, they I'll... just. Yeah, I've I had a couple actually... PS2 ones to me I thought were okay, but they were ones that just never, uh, I don't know, they just never seemed as like fun as they should have been. The the ones on PS2 and Xbox and GameCube, like Save the Earth or Destroy All Monsters, those are pretty decent games. I wouldn't say they're like amazing, but they're they're pretty fun. Uh, but one game I was hyped about was godzilla on the ps4 i was hyped about that i almost imported it because i didn't think it was going to come out to uh america i was going to import the uh ps4 copy and and i was going to play it that way i was like man even if it's all in japanese it's just godzilla you know he's going to run around and destroy stuff and i got the game and i played it and here here's the thing okay it's not a bad game for people that are big fans of Toho movies. And what I mean by that is like it's almost like a Toho movie simulator. It feels like you're making a Toho movie. It doesn't feel like you're playing a Godzilla game. Um, for that, it's got a lot of fan service. It's got a lot of like little stuff that you can do here and there. But as a game itself, it is horrible. Uh, you know, Godzilla moves very slow. Godzilla moves slow anyway, but he moves even slower in this one. You'd think he would like pick up the speed with the wonders of video games minus the rubber suit. But he moves like really slow. The objectives became very repetitive. It's like, oh, destroy this building. Okay, now destroy this house. You're like, wait a minute, I just destroyed a building. I destroy this skyscraper. You know, it was this... And it just got so repetitive, and I was like, oh, man. And I, I hate that I spent $60 on that game because that game dropped price so quick. I remember it was like, at one point, it was like $5 on PSN. And I was like telling my friends, I'm like, yeah, if you like Godzilla, check it out for $5. I mean, it's, it's a Godzilla fan game, but it's not a good game, if that makes any sense. 
Yeah. I mean, another one, too, for me, uh, even in the Yakuza series, I've mentioned it before, and I don't really know if, what I was expecting. I think I thought it would be a bit more like the series, but Yakuza Dead Souls. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I knew my friend Jason was asking me about Dead Souls, and I hadn't played it, so I couldn't really tell him too much about it. Dead Souls is a game. It, now, it's okay if you're really into the series. Uh, it's one if you didn't play the series at all and just picked it up, you'd probably be like, man, this is terrible. Like, what is this? It just feels kind of a little bit archaic. Uh, you know, it's not – you kind of have your missions. You have Majima and Kiryu and a couple other guys. You play as them. It was the first time you could play as uh, – Majima. It was very funny, too, because he's sitting in his room, and he's watching a zombie movie, and zombies, he's like, this is awesome, and zombies actually start coming in. He's having fun, you know, killing them, because he's insane. Um, But it's just set up different guns. Guns play a big part. Uh, Maybe if you went around actually just beating up and fighting, you know, with the good fighting engine in the game, it would have been a bit better, but the the shooting to me felt like old Resident Evil, where you just kind of pointed... Oh, yeah. And kind of hoped you hit something. Well, well like, uh, the shooting in Yakuza games were, were never that great to begin with. Like, no. Uh, like, I always felt like I was kind of cheating at the game anyway when I would use a gun. I, like, tried yeah. not to use a gun in that game. It's like when you're in a fight and you just you get knocked down. You know, I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, oh, man, that fucker's got a gun. You gotta go yeah, and no, run you're down like, and beat him first. Yep. <laughs> that and stun guns, dude. The stun guns are the worst. <laughs> But, uh, you know, like I said, if you're really into the series, it is a cheap game. But, you know, I also lay blame on that for causing the hold up with five and everything because they put it out and it didn't sell good. And because I think even the people that love the series were just, you know, it, it's non canon, uh, but it is kind of like its own little side story. And it's one I'm probably going to go back and maybe give it another shot. But, uh,. It just, uh, man, I don't know, it's got a bit of like a, a, a dead rising, like not really have as much fun stuff to use as you did like in a mall, but there's just lots of zombies everywhere. It seems like I was going in a bunch of circles, kind of like how you would in a, like a mall that was round, but uh, just overall a, a bit of a letdown. You know, it, it's weird and like I said, it's okay. Someone might like it if you're really into the series. Hey, I'm not going to say, you know, this game sucks. It's probably like 12 bucks. So, you know, if someone likes it and plays and gets some joy out of it, you know, like I said, it it just has its funny moments, but it's not uh, necessarily a yak as a game as any of the other ones anyone might have played. Yeah, uh, that's like, uh, like I said the other day, uh, Jason, I think he was at uh, GameStop or some some retro store and he was asking about Dead Souls because I think he saw a copy for like 12 bucks. He's like, should I get it? Because, I mean, he, he just beat Zero. He was about to get Kiwami. He's really gotten into the series. He's like, should I get it? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I was like, because it's, it's, it's one of those games that when you ask, like, long-time Yakuza fans, be like, how's Dead Souls? They're kind of like, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They're kind of, like, tilting their head and, like, you know, rubbing the back of their neck. Like, ah, oh, you know, it's um, it's not a bad game. <laughs> it's almost like some kind of experiment. I think a lot of it, you know, the reason it came out here. They like they chose to put that one out instead of five first, which like I said messed everything up. And it was just kind of jumping in on the zombie craze. Um, yeah, you know, around that time, you know, there was just a lot more. Whether it was games, and movies, Walking Dead. Um, I think they were trying to capitalize on that. Where it's one I think that should have just probably just stayed in Japan. Like I don't even really know if it did like really well over there. It's just, I would I would have wanted I would have rather had the the samurai uh, style games. Yeah, those definitely would have been, uh, and I think they probably would have done just as they probably would have sold better, just because more of the fans because they play like Yakuza, and uh, even though they're their own you know side story too. Almost a very very super early prequel in a sense. Um, <laughs> But that would have been better off. But, you know, hey, they thought the zombie thing was going to pay off, and it just it just didn't. It was a huge fail. And, you know, like, so that one overall is why that one is so disappointing, just because of all the consequences it carried with it, you know. 
I kind of I, I harbor some ill will towards that game. You know, even though everything's okay now, thing panned out. It's all good, but <laughs> man, first, game messed up my life for a while. Man. I was gonna say the first, the first two years of Excess Game Podcast, you were one salty Sega fan. Just all <laughs> hurt feelings and everything, man. Oh man, but uh, it's all good. I love you now, Sega. <laughs> well, what we're gonna get into, we're gonna get into games we've been playing recently. And the reason why I'm doing it now is because it kind of segues way well to the main topic because it, this gave me the idea of this episode and it's a game that you've been playing and I, I don't know if your thoughts on it have changed, but I'm just going to throw the mic at you. Just toss it over to you. Yeah, and, and it, it's still one I want to go back to and it is Metroid um, Return of Samus. I was really excited about it. Um of course, I missed out. I did see. Did I get the? Uh, no, I didn't even pre-order it. I missed out on the Amiibos, which I wanted to. And it's just, you know, it's one of my favorite Game Boy games. Uh, not one I want to go back and play back now. You know, it's it's very uh, tedious. But I loved it back then. I loved it when they did Metroid Zero. I'm like, man, this is gonna be great. You know, I think I, I was off that day. Went down. You know, got it. And uh, came home, popped it in, and just proceeded to start to die, like a whole bunch. And uh, it really just kind of threw me back, and I, I just kind of put it down. I was like, man, I don't get it. And and I did talk about it on the access page, and I did mention, I said, maybe it's me, you know, because I yeah. am kind of terrible at games sometimes. Uh, and I think maybe I just wasn't in the right mindset. It's one, actually, the next couple of days, I'm going to sit back down and play. Uh, my brother picked it up, and he was like, man, he's like, give, give it another shot. He's like, I think maybe you're just having a bad day. And how you mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes it's just that right mood. Uh, maybe I just didn't have the patience to sit there because I was sucking and getting killed. Um, it was just a, a, a lot of that. So I, I'm kind of curious to go back to it with a, a more of an open mind and see how it goes. And I'm kind of hoping I like it a little bit better, you know. Probably won't end up loving it like a uh, you know zero mission, but uh, but maybe it'll be a nice little uh, it, you know hold its place in the Metroid series. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, man. When Me- when when you told me the other day when Metroid was coming out, you're like, "Are you getting Metroid?" I'm like, "Oh fuck, I forgot about it." I mean, because I've been just so caught up in the you know other games like Sonic Mania and Yakuza Kiwami, Mario Rabbids, you know stuff. So, but. Uh, I mean, have you been playing anything else other than that, or? Oh well, actually, yeah, yeah, because uh, I didn't play that one for very long. Um, been getting some games on the on the eShop. I still love uh, turning on the Switch and you know seeing what's new, whatever day. I don't know when they get their games. Is it Fridays or? Not sure, but uh, I did pick up a new uh, crappy graphic game called oh, nice. uh, Kingdom New Lands. And just looked kind of interesting with somebody on a horse, you know. I wasn't really sure what it was about, uh, but it's kind of like a town building game. Um, start out, you know, you get like a little bit of money, you meet some people, you throw a couple dollars their way, and they start helping you out. And then you start building a town. Uh, you can buy weapons for the people. So like I said, it's very simple, you know, because it's the crappy graphics but at night these monsters come and they try to come into your little village and uh you got to have your archers and you know walls set up to keep them out or they'll come in and steal your crown which i first time i lost that was the whole point is just to to keep a hold of your crown but you want to build up you know the town and you can just build it up more and more now it you know i keep dying or just either running out of money at some point where i can't build up anymore so i don't really know how long this game goes on if you can you know build up one and go to the other but uh it really just kind of grabbed me you know i had a lot of fun man i sat there for a while i I realized something i was doing wrong and the next time you know it's like a correct it build up something a little bit more just a really uh really fun game and i haven't really played many uh kind of you know, I don't know if that is like a like a kingdom builder or you know city building games. It's not really anything on the level like a Sim City, you know. But it's kind of a kind of in that vein. It sounds uh, it sounds very similar to Dragon Quest Builders because I kind of had the same experience where 
I don't really play those kind of games. Like, I'm not a Minecraft player by any means, but I know the Dragon Quest builders, like, attracted me from the get-go just because it's Dragon Quest, and I love that series. But, you know, I played it, and it actually gave me more enjoyment than I was expecting. Yeah, I could see how these, you know, kind of grab a hold of people. And with Kingdom, you know, it's a very, very simple. Um, but man, it, you know, it just kind of nailed it. And uh, even the little creatures at night, like I said, I've come to gain a lot more respect for these games. Um, creatures can be kind of creepy when they come out running, chasing you, and you're out of town. You're trying to get back behind your wall. Um, I guess maybe like the low graphics kind of help, you know, with the imagination of it all. But, you know, pretty fun. I also picked up Thimbleweed Park. And this one had come out on PS4 and probably Xbox uh, a few months back. But it's from some of the creators of Maniac Mansion and um, with a Monkey Island. So it is a point and click. Uh, it's got a very X Files feel to it. You, know, you go to a town. There's two federal agents who look a lot like Mulder and Scully, and um, you just go around and interact with the weird people in this town. A lot of shops are closed up. Um, you know, you got a weird sheriff. There's people in pigeon outfits. Uh, but it's the point and click. You know, everything. Open this. Lots of that. Lots of moving the cursor around. Uh, and I hadn't played one of those in a while, and it just uh, was always kind of curious about it on PS4, but, you know, lack of room. So picked it up and played it for a bit, and, you know, definitely a pretty fun one. And picked up a couple other ones as usual. Uh, I got Beach Buggy Racing, uh, but I haven't played it yet. I got Implosion, which I think was one you had told me about. Oh, yeah, that's um, a good one. And I haven't played that yet either. It's like I, I constantly have games on my Switch that uh, I, I need to play. Uh, but it's just fun, man. I'll just sit on there and you know pick up a couple I know I'm going to get to at some point. And then eventually I do. But um, that's about the most of it there. You know, just kind of been hanging around. I watched Point Break for the first time. Oh, nice. Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves surfing and stuff. Yeah, somehow I missed that, you know. 20 something years ago <laughs> that was pretty good i did see the new it what'd you what'd you think of it you know i th- I thought it was pretty good i mean it's not like the greatest thing in the world um i enjoyed it it felt like i told my wife she, she went and wanted to go see it with me this is the, was the third time she saw it um i guess she really likes it but uh it's kind of long it felt like two hours and 15 minutes i mean not really like in a bad way but some movies fly by uh, but then we went back and watched the old miniseries and with the old miniseries you know it's like i kind of like the first part so a lot of people are like the focus on the kids uh i did like the kids in the new one and i'm curious to see with the second one because uh, with the old one when it got to the adults it just it wasn't as good so i wonder if it's going to have a lot you know still a lot more flashback things with the kids or if more of the focus in the next chapter is going to be you know more adults um i still like tim curry the best yeah. uh this clown is just already kind of creepy looking whereas the the tim curry version just looked like your normal clown but then he could turn creepy where this one just already looks kind of gross but uh still thought he did good um you know i like both and then we actually started listening to the audio book which is uh 42 hours long so that's gonna oh, take wow. a while to get through we've uh, yeah, started like thousand, going through that yes yeah, like a, a thousand page book like it's really thick. yeah guy at work there told me he hated the new one like he loved the book he's like you should read the book and i was like man I don't, i'm probably not gonna read that book man that's really long i was like i think i'm gonna listen to it because i got the audible and uh i got it on that so far book seems good i'm sure there's many things you know that just aren't in the movie little things they skip um it's just certain things about some of the characters that you know i didn't know about to listening through this so you know, I think it's something if someone is a fan of the, uh, you know, the movie where there's the miniseries, the new one, and they're you know curious about the book, the audio is always a good way to go if you have trouble sitting down and you know reading it. But I also hadn't been to the movie theater, and man, it felt like a couple years. 
So, um, but overall, like I said, I, I liked it. Um, looking forward to the next one. I don't know when it's set to come out. You know, hopefully it's not like years and years. Be cool if it was just like next year. But uh, yeah, good movie. Not the greatest thing in the world, but yeah, I, I liked it. To me, I thought I was the same way. I was like, it wasn't the best movie in the world, but I was like, it's it's one of the better horror movies that Hollywood's put out in a while. You know, it was it was really good. I think what really sold that movie though was the kids. The kids really sold that movie. Uh, you know, the the actor that played Pennywise, um, very different than, than Tim Curry's Pennywise, which is not a bad thing. I like the fact that he was, you know, playing Pennywise. He wasn't playing Tim Curry playing Pennywise. Yeah. You know, I like the fact that he did it his own way, and um, it, it was good. It, was, it wasn't it was like, you know, an amazing movie. It's probably a movie that, you know, I watched it that one time. I probably won't go back to it till like, years later when I see it, like, on TV or something. You know, I'm not going to go my way and watch it over and over again. I think one of the best things about it is just to see all the people that, you know, are excited about it and enjoying oh, yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, uh, it's set, I think, you know, like some maybe opening weekend records or it was something like that going on. But people have just been, uh, you know, really excited about it. And that's the cool thing, you know, to have a horror movie that so many people want to go see and are talking about. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, it will bring out more and more, you know, good movies like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just nice to hear, you know, a remake that, you know, a new adaptation that's getting praise instead of people being like, oh, my childhood. I mean, that's, that's nice. It's nice to hear positivity. Yeah, because I think it's kind of, I mean, the, you know, the old miniseries was all right. I think people maybe have fonder memories of it than they think. Because when you go back, like I said, it's all right. Like, when I first bought the old one, it was missing the the disc, the second disc. So a couple of years ago when we watched it, we watched the first half. And I told my wife, I said, well, that's the best part anyway. And uh, watching the whole thing the other day, uh, it was kind of like, yeah. Even she was like, yeah, I just kind of like the first half. So that one really kind of, I think, fails in, in that part. So uh, I don't think the new one will be like that. But, you know, like I said, if, I wonder if... I hope it still has some stuff, you know, with the kids. Yeah, they were, uh, you know, like I said, one of the best parts. So, should be good either way. I, th- I think um, I'm, I'm very curious, and I will probably actually go, uh, go see that when it comes out. Instead of my wife like kind of forcing me to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do, I do have one uh, funny story about it before before I get into games I've been playing recently. Uh, the first time I ever saw it was actually uh, when I was a kid, I was probably like seven or eight, I had gotten uh, food poisoning from Taco Bell, and I went to the hospital about like three or four o'clock in the morning, and in the waiting room, <laughs> in the waiting room, they had the TV on like TBS, and they were fucking showing it in the hospital waiting room at like four o'clock in the morning. Isn't that like the funniest thing ever? I was like... I was sitting there and I was like watching it, and I'm like, "Oh, it's a clown!" And I wasn't even really scared, you know. The movie never really scared me as a kid. It just made me feel like I was like thinking in my head, I'm "Like this isn't really appropriate for a hospital waiting room," <laughs> <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know. Like you're sitting there like watching like this kid get drugged down in the sewer drain while you're like sitting there, you know, dry heaving because you had some bad tacos. That's just not a good time as a seven or eight year old <laughs> what a what a memory though right? Yeah, I know, right <laughs> but uh games i've been playing recently you know i i don't know if i mentioned it on the last episode maybe it was i was just playing it but i did finish mario rabbits i finished that really great game really really fun really surprising i had i really had minimal expectations about it i didn't i didn't i wasn't really that hyped um, I pretty much got it because I had a lot of trading credit, and I was like, alright, well, I'm going to go ahead and check this game out. But it wasn't one of those games when they were announcing stuff at E3, and people were like, holy crap, Mario Rabbids. I was not one of those kind of people, because I'm not really that big in the strategy games. But this was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was very simplistic, but it was very complex with strategy, but it was just easy to pick up. A lot of fun. Played that, uh... And other than that, I mean, I played a little bit of retro stuff here and there. 
uh, you know, some Neo Geo. I played some Windjammers on my Pi just because the the PS4 version came out, which I heard is really not that good. It's got some really bad frame rate issues. So I'm glad I didn't buy that. But I played Windjammers, you know, I played a couple other games. But then I went back and played uh, Yakuza Kiwami, and I beat that just a couple of days ago. Um, I beat it, and I only, like, completed about, like, 25% of the whole game. I beat it in about, like, 50 hours. So I saved it right before I beat it. So I'm going to probably just go back in that old save right before the end of the game. Because, you know, before you finish the game, they were like, Oh, this is going to be the last chance that you can run around and do whatever you got to do before the final battle. And I'm glad they do that. That's really cool. Yeah, that's always cool. Like, you just, like, it's just, you know, something major's coming up. So it's like, you know, finish any of your little BS crap you need to do. <laughs> and uh, then you can just go on ahead. But, you know, I guess that they like to do that since they're, they know, you know, you're probably involved in other, you know, little sub stories or, you know, anything on the side. Because sometimes you just, you know, you, sometimes you can still go back to it, but sometimes you can't. Especially if it's the very, like, you know, last one. Then. There's no yeah. going back after that boss. So, so yeah, so I want to probably go back and play some more of like the mini games. I want to do more of that, uh, the the bug wrestling in the Sega Arcade. I want to do some more of that. That was a lot of fun. And I'm going to probably do some more pocket racing, you know. Try to, oh, try the to... pocket racing, did you do some of that? I did a little bit of it. Um, I think I did enough that I, I got into it. And then it was probably going to be like one of those things. Like once I got into it and played a little bit more, I'd probably hopefully not get cheated like you did in Zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, I just I had to quit, man. It, it's all like the thing I learned. It's all about the uh, it's all about the parts, you know. It's like yeah. You don't control any of it. Uh, and the thing was, a lot of the parts you had to get out of the uh, dream machines, and you, you had to find them in like other places. And it just it got to it just got to me. Yeah. No pocket racing. I might check it out though when I uh, run into it on Kiwami. It, it, I'm gonna it, finish up Zero here and uh, yeah, I'm still kind of lingering on the end there. Just hadn't uh, played it recently, but I'm gonna go ahead and and knock that out while I'm off coming up here. Well, I mean, I will say the pocket racing Kiwami has a really nice little Easter egg that connects with Zero that I think you'll really enjoy. Ah, uh, uh, you'll really enjoy that. But I mean. That that's pretty much it because I mean like you know when you when I play the Yakuza game I mean when I play those I'm pretty much just playing those games because there's so much you can do I mean when I'm what, what time I do have the game like say I got like four hours of free time it's mostly just going to that game like I'm not playing other stuff um, I was debating actually of going to uh, Yakuza four I was debating if I wanted to go ahead and go into that. But at the same time, I got Mario Galaxy uh, coming out next month. But at the same time, that's the beauty of the the Yakuza series, the Yakuza series. You can play a little bit of it, put it down, and pick it up yeah. months. The later. thing is, too, with that one, even uh, it's uh, even a little bit easier because you have four different characters you play as. Mm -hmm. So you know you can just play a bit, you know, with one of the guys and quit for a bit, and then when you go back, it's kind of like. Each of the stories are attached, but each one's kind of like new because they each got their own things going on, and uh, they all play quite differently too. And I really, uh, really liked how they did that. Uh, they, lots of variety. Uh, you know, you still got your Kiryu, of course, but then you know you got like a big slow guy, and then you got more like a fast cop, and uh, just really uh, uh, lots of variety there. I hear I hear four is like a like one of the best in the series. I uh, yeah I mean four four was really great. Um, I did like that one a lot. Five is still one of my favorites too, uh, and that extends of course off of you know the the multiple guys, which I think it's even it's even like five people you play as in five. I, it might have stayed around four, but you know just so much. And, you know, you should probably go ahead and, and jump into it, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, that's pretty much what I've been playing, and um, I think this is going to wrap up the episode. I think we, we covered we covered everything with gaming news, and uh, did you have any last uh, games that, that you're hyped for that just didn't live up to your full potential? 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 <laughs> uh... 
X Men on the Nintendo. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Double uh, Dragon was a little bit of a, a letdown too. Um, always with any of the games like that, that and Final Fight, mainly just due to like you know two player functions. Yeah, that's and like, actually, that's wait, you know, feel. I do got one more as far as a game I played and a game that I just uh, I don't know if a little bit let down. I I got Lego Worlds. I just was like, man, like over like this sounds kind of cool, and I got it, and uh, I don't know, I just don't think that game is for me. I'm not really into the like the building kind of sounded fun. I see, as I mentioned, like town building stuff with the kingdom, uh, which is uh, you know the very simple game which I liked, but Lego Worlds was just uh, yeah, it, it could have just... been my mood too. I was like, man, this is just a lot of. Like I gotta find this part, and then I gotta move this stuff around. I can like I don't know if I want to build all this stuff. Like I like building real Legos, but uh, you know it's not really a game. It doesn't feel like the other ones. Uh, you know any of the ones based on the movies, the Lego City. Uh, it just doesn't feel like that. You know you're still walking around and interacting with others, but it's more of the you know building stuff. So I'm gonna give another shot later on, but. Uh, just so far, I just had to, haven't really had the desire to go back to it. Yeah, and I mean, maybe it's uh, maybe it's the fact too that it is a Lego game, and uh, you know, when I when I think of Lego games, I think of like the the movie franchise and stuff like that, which play very differently. They're not really building sims; and they have some building aspects to it, but it's not just you know, you know, you're not playing Harry Potter and you're building Hogwarts. You're still in Hogwarts, and there's still a story there. So maybe that's what kind of did it. Maybe. Yeah. I, I probably didn't even really know what this game was. Like, I don't even know what I was expecting. I was just kind of like, huh, Lego. I was like, I think I want to play that. It was like, cheaper, and yeah. Because, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure it's very different than, like, say, Lego, like, under Undercover. Yeah. I mean, like, you, you know, you've kind of got your different worlds you go to, but it's more about, you know, interacting with people. You do have little missions to do, and that unlocks other pieces and then i guess at some point you can just build all this stuff up because i got to one area it was kind of like a little island and i had to help a guy out of a pit and i had to move some pieces to build something and i just i don't know i don't think my brain was clicking with it right either where i was fully grasping it um like i said i, I might go back and give another shot much, much like metroid but uh I just think I just think I didn't know what I was buying. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I have no idea what I'm gonna get myself into. Wouldn't that be fifteen dollars, sir? All right. Yeah. <laughs> well guys, uh this includes another episode of XS Gaming Podcast. I wanna thank you guys for checking us out and uh if you're a first time listener, um hey, how's it going? Also check us out on I- iTunes. Uh, leave us a little review if you're listening to us on iTunes check us out on Podomatic or on YouTube uh, my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Xander Scullion and uh, it's more than just a podcast I do a, a bunch of other kinds of content I'm currently working on a, a sitcom called Two Odd Gamers with myself and my alter ego Kevin Savage the elitist Kevin collector Savage. the elitist collector and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun I'm, right now I'm working on some of those episodes, I'm working on some actual content like uh, my other little series called Games You Should Check Out, where I talk about games I recommend, and I have recommendations from uh, you know other content creators with our One Minute Crunch, where they describe a game or recommend it in at least one minute, and uh, you can check that out on youtubecom slash Scully. And all the links will be on the description of this episode, rather you listen to us on uh, iTunes or on Podomatic. Anyway, guys, as always, thanks for listening, and as always, happy gaming. Have a pleasant evening, everybody.